Hello everyone, I'm Charlotte. And I'm Dina. Welcome to The Grim Curriculum. If this is your first time joining us, welcome. Yes, hello. We release new episodes every Saturday, and our second show, The Grim Curriculum Extra Credit, comes out every second Wednesday. If you aren't already following wherever you're listening today, please hit that follow button and turn on your notifications so you don't miss out on any of the grim fun. And with that being said... Well, you (laughs) definitely picked one hell of an episode to start Uh, out on. And to those of you who already know what to expect, let's just say this. I I went into this case with very limited knowledge. And I have to say, every single bit of the knowledge I have gained is terrible. Mm -hmm. This is a particularly awful case. And going into this, I wasn't super familiar with Harvey himself, but... I've seen the victim's photos. We're going to get into those later. And they they really, really stick with you. Yeah. And I think it's for that very reason that this is one of those cases that really sticks with you because the photos are, they're rough, guys. It's pretty disturbing. Yeah. It's, it's one of the few times where I knew what the victims looked like, but not the killer. Yes. Yes, exactly. And speaking of, we also want to throw out a super quick warning that this is going to enter ick territory very quickly today. Yep, absolutely. This is going to be a rough one. Today we are covering Harvey Glattman, also known as the Glamour Girl Slayer and the Lonely Hearts Killer. He was active from 1957 to 1958, and believe it or not, he was actually executed the following year. He lured his victims into a false sense of security by claiming to be a professional photographer who could help them launch a modeling career. We know for a fact that three women lost their lives to this monster with a potential fourth that has never been confirmed. This is by far one of the darkest stories we have ever told. Yeah, honestly, there isn't much we can say to prepare you all for this one, so let's just get into it. This is going to be a two-part series, so during part one, we're going to cover his early life as well as the shocking escalation of his crimes during his late teens. Next week, we'll be getting into the grisly details of the murders as well as his trial. And his execution. This is someone who victimized countless people before he actually murdered anyone. And I just want to point out that today, again, we have Sophie the Cat joining us. She cannot be tamed, so you're going to hear (laughs) murmurs and her opinions and... I think we're just going to have to accept that she might be the third host. I don't know. Oh, absolutely. Uh, Returning special guest, Sophie the Cat. Yes. Thank you, Sophie. She's here for emotional support for this one. We're going to need it. Something interesting to note about Harvey Glattman is that while he is now considered a serial killer, he was out there doing his thing nine years before the term even existed and almost 20 years before the public became aware of it. A real trailblazer, you might say. Yes, and we also want to quickly discuss something about the victim's photos. Like we mentioned, Harvey Glattman took photos of his victims, but he took the photos before he killed them. This is something that we're going to be discussing a little bit later. Out of respect for his victims, we are not going to be showing any of those photos in any of our social media posts or on YouTube. If you want to see them, you know how to use Google, and you'll find them out there pretty easily. But honestly, we just feel like it isn't something that needs to be seen. Honestly, don't think that's how someone should be remembered. Yeah, I'm with you on that. Some of the photos are incredibly not safe for work in a way that's going to stick with you for a long time. And honestly, you don't need any of that in your lives. But if for whatever reason you think you do, don't say we didn't warn you. All right. So it's been a while since we've covered someone this bad. Yeah, so all that being said, now that you guys are prepped, it's almost time to get into the terrible tale of Harvey Glattman. But before we get into his awful time on Earth, we want to take a moment to discuss this particular kind of serial killer. So far, we've covered a few of these guys. Harvey Glattman falls under the sexual sadist category of serial killers. Along with him, we have Pee Wee Gaskins, Luis Garavito, and Danny Rowling. And if you want to further ruin your day, you should check out those episodes too. Yeah. All right. So the sexual sadist is fueled by a perverted desire that's often considered abnormal in some way. Exactly. It's more about the infliction of the pain that turns them on. You know, we've covered a wide variety of childhoods when it comes to serial killers. 
unfortunately, a lot of the time, people do become somewhat of a product of their environment. Absolutely. Look at people like Pee Wee Gaskins or Eileen Wernos, for example. I don't want to say that they didn't stand a chance, but damn, were the odds ever against them. Like we always say, your upbringing is not an excuse for bad behavior, but it can't be ignored that many of the killers we've spoken about have a history of abuse and neglect in their younger years. But every now and then, there's an anomaly. Someone who grows up in a home where there's at least some form of love and support, but they still have something within them that pushes them towards nefarious behavior. Harvey Glattman is one of those people. His youth was not perfect by any means, but this is another one of those cases where it really makes you wonder if serial killers are born, made, or a combination of the two. And like we said, we're going to be talking about a man who was setting off alarm bells before he could even read. That's not at all an exaggeration. Nope. Harvey Murray Glattman was born on December 10th, 1927 in the Bronx. Shortly after he was born, Harvey, his mother Ophelia, and his father Albert all moved to Denver, Colorado. His father worked as a milliner. Which is a hat maker. Yes, and he originally owned a hat store in the Bronx, but I guess the hat industry was more booming in Denver, so they relocated for better business opportunities. Harvey was an only child, and it didn't take long until his parents began to notice something that wasn't quite right with their little boy. One day, when he was only four years old, Ophelia walked in on him doing something. And we figured the best way to describe this was to use her own words from her court testimony. She stated that he had tied a string around his penis, placed the loose end in a drawer, and then leaned back against the string. Yep. And rather than address this, or even just put a pin in it for later, they decided that his actions were just that of a curious child, and that was that. Or so they thought. And I just want to add something. Mm Mm-hmm. Is is it not kind of impressive that a four-year-old can tie things this well? I just realized. Like, could he tie his own shoe? Well, that's the thing. I I did read somewhere that he had quite a high IQ, but I didn't, I wasn't sure how reliable that actually was. It just seems odd that a child would think of something like this, but I, I don't know. It's Harvey Glattman, you guys. I guess so. As he got older, anytime his parents caught him masturbating, they would basically just be like, hey, don't do that. You'll go blind. He began to also have horrible mood swings that left him violent and inconsolable. Whenever this happened, his father would simply just beat the crap out of him until he stopped. Just some classic old-timey parenting right there. Yep. And surprise, surprise, he didn't have that many friends other than some kids that he would sometimes play with after school. It was pretty certain that they were all boys because Harvey was absolutely petrified of the opposite sex. He was the kind of guy who would see a pretty girl and lose all ability to talk. He'd just kind of stand there being very awkward with his knees shaken. It also didn't help the fact that the other kids bullied him pretty badly for his appearance. His overgrown teeth and his big ears earned him nicknames like Chipmunk and Weasel. Harvey was overall just really inappropriate. He would laugh at weird times like when something sad happened, and he was too shy to really make any other close friends. It just seemed like he couldn't relate to any of the other kids. And the older he got, the less like the other kids he became. Most of his peers spent their time after school playing or participating in sports, but Harvey had other hobbies. As time went on, tying a string around himself stopped being enough, and he had to come up with new ways to keep himself entertained. That's right. So eventually, the string turned into a rope. A rope that he would tie around his neck and throw over a pipe or anything strong enough to support his body weight. He would then pull on the rope to tighten it with one hand and use the other hand on himself. We told you this story would be disturbing. (sighs) Dear listener, in case you haven't picked up on it yet, Harvey was engaging in full-blown autoerotic asphyxiation before he even hit puberty. In the book aptly named Rope by Michael Newton, this is described as... 
Harvey's sex game, variously known as autoerotic asphyxia, asphyxophilia, or hypopoxphilia, is not the same thing as masochism and involves self-induced strangulation or suffocation during masturbation. Gasping appears to be an ancient practice. Asphyxiation itself creates excitement and eventually euphoria even without genital stimulation due to the adrenaline produced when the human body perceives a life-threatening situation. And I want to just throw something out here. Of course. We do what you want to do in the bedroom, folks. Oh, you absolutely. know, like we're yeah. we're not we're not here to kink shame. We're not here to shame anybody. But no, we're very um sex positive people. Of course, yes. But this is, and we're gonna remind you this a lot. This is not like a child. Yes, guys. Like he is younger than ten years old when this is happening. So, you know, it's I hate concerning. To use, yeah, exactly. I hate to use the word normal because, you know, what is normal? But concerning is definitely the right word for it. There's just something not right with that boy. When Harvey was around the age of 11, they recognized that something was obviously wrong and that they needed to act quickly. After some discussion, they figured that a change of scenery would be good for him. Soon after, the Glatmans moved from the Bronx to Denver. He seemed to do okay at his new school, and for a while his parents thought the problem had resolved itself. However, they did know that he was still keeping some nudie mags under his bed, but in the grand scheme of things, it didn't seem like that big of a deal. That is, until one evening they came home to find their son's neck swollen and bruised. This was pretty difficult for Ophelia and Albert to downplay, uh, you know, this kind of behavior at this point. They actually ended up taking their son to see the doctor to make sure nothing was wrong with him. They were assured that he would grow out of these strange habits. Yeah, they were basically told that it was just a part of puberty and him discovering his own body and that they shouldn't be too worried. The doctor in this particular case could not have been more wrong. And we know mental health and medicine were looked at very differently back in 1938. But at the end of the day, you have a kid constantly choking himself, which has to be at least some kind of a red flag. Yes. Um, really, all this did was teach Harvey that he needed to hide his pastimes better and that he was able to figure out how to hide them fairly quickly. He had zero intention on stopping what he was doing. In fact, to jump forward a little bit here, after he was arrested, he told officers, It seems like I always had a piece of rope in my hands when I was a kid. I guess I was kind of fascinated by rope. As he got older, school became more difficult. He struggled to pay attention in class, but that was just the start of his problems. Puberty hadn't exactly treated him well. It basically left him with a face full of acne and zero self-confidence. Many argue that this, along with his already bizarre habits, was a recipe for disaster. Harvey started breaking into houses when he was in high school. At first, he would break in for the thrill of being somewhere that he shouldn't. Soon after, he began to steal things. Well, I mean, if you're already doing a B and E, you may as well add burglary to it. Exactly. Why not? At first, he chose the houses at random, often picking them based on just convenience or a whim. Eventually, he started choosing the houses more carefully based on who actually lived in them. He didn't really get caught for any of these crimes, but he did manage to steal a gun from one of the homes. It didn't take long until this just wasn't enough and he needed more. He wasn't really able to talk to the opposite sex, but that didn't mean that he wasn't interested. He started picking women off the street that he found attractive. And remember, he's just a kid while he's doing this. I know we seem to be stating that a lot, but this is like... He's in high school. His strange behavior begins so young, but then over the course of just a few years, he's escalated at an incredibly scary rate. I would argue that we've never covered someone who escalates just this quickly. And so and young. Exactly. Rather than strike up a conversation with these women, he would follow them home and break in at a later time to assault them. He would usually get in through an unlocked door or window. I swear at some point we're just going to start our own line of the grim curriculum door locks that shriek at you if you don't lock your door when you get into your house. Oh, I mean, guys, like if you're not someone that locks your doors, I don't want to be a fear mongerer, but we've seen it time and time and again that some people are truly like 
crimes of convenience. So lock your doors and windows, please. Yes, especially in this day and age. We live in a dangerous world. Yep. We sound like such paranoid old ladies, seriously. But it's true. It's so true. Harvey's confidence grew with each assault. Soon, the tax increased and became more and more aggressive. Harvey started carrying certain items with him. He never went anywhere without a cord, rope, and something to use as a gag. He would tie these women up at gunpoint and force them to lay with him. This eventually turned into him touching their bodies and masturbating. And then the photos started. If you're at all familiar with Harvey Glattman, then you probably have seen those photos already. It truly shows how horrifying he was as a person. Again, does he ever escalate? Someone like this, doing this kind of stuff, they're bound to eventually take a life, whether it's intentional or not. People who do things like this tend to either get caught early in the game or they do end up killing someone. This doesn't tend to be the kind of behavior that people do once and then stop. On May 18th, 1945, Harvey was caught trying to break into the apartment of Elma Hamoum. The police found the items that he carried with him as well as the gun. He confessed that he had been breaking into houses to steal. He left out the fact that he had assaulted numerous women at this point, but at least he was arrested. Unfortunately, he was bailed out very quickly, and it was his mother that bailed him out. This cost her $6,000 that she had to pay in three installments. And friendly reminder, this is in 1945, so today that'd be somewhere around $100,000. It goes without saying that that is a ton of money. So if I were his mom, I would have been furious. Yeah, they they did. They weren't like rich people. No, not really. I mean, his his father was a hat maker, but, you know, it's not like he had a chain or anything. He just had a simple little store. Exactly. And then also, so while he's behind bars, he's completely failed high school. Like his parents must have been pulling their hair out with this kid. Oh, absolutely. If he's not, like, in jail, he's, like, tying himself up and masturbating. Like, what are you going to do? I know. And they're probably thinking, like, thank God he's an only child. Can you imagine if he had siblings? Oh, my God. (sighs) So, but to him, at least he was free. It didn't take long until he would strike again. This time, he kidnapped a woman named Noreen, and he took her to Sunshine Canyon. He tied her up, he gagged her, and then he touched her while he masturbated. And when he finished, he took her home and then just left. It does seem like Noreen was one of the first victims to report what he had done to her. When the police showed her a series of mugshots, she picked out Harvey almost immediately. He was arrested again and sentenced to serve one year at the Colorado State Prison. During his time in Colorado State, he was taught to work on TVs, something that he would become very good at. His time in prison, once again, didn't last long. A few weeks after his arrest, he was released on bail. He spent from July 31st to September 8th at the Colorado Psychopathic Hospital. On September 27th, mere weeks after his release from the hospital, he sexually assaulted three women. The first two he bound and gagged. After he assaulted them, he robbed them. This is all in one day, too. He broke into the third woman's house and he assaulted her. Luckily, she was able to escape and she ran out of her house for help. Three days later, he was arrested once again and sent to Denver County Jail. So we're already on what? Arrest three? Four? Yep, exactly. The time between his crimes and his execution is honestly surprisingly short. Like, this is going to happen so fast, it's horrifying. He spent most of November that year on trial for his various assaults, and eventually he was sentenced to one to five years at the Colorado State Pen, where he would be known as Prisoner 23863. He would be released less than eight months later for good behavior. Once again, it was determined that Harvey needed a change of scenery. His mother helped him find an apartment back in New York. She even set him up with a job as a TV repairman. Ophelia stayed in New York for a little bit until she felt that everything was fine. She eventually returned home to Denver. But things were very obviously not fine. In fact, almost immediately after she left, Harvey was back at it again. He had learned from his mistakes and he made some changes to ensure that he wouldn't get caught again. One of them was that he stopped using a real gun. 
being caught with one would send him back to prison for a long time. Instead, he purchased a toy gun that he would use during the assaults. On August 17th, 1946, he attacked Doris Thorne and Thomas Starrow while they were out for a walk. He tied them both up and began to assault Doris. Luckily, Thomas was able to break free. He went after Harvey in an attempt to stop the assault. Eventually, Harvey was able to run off. And you know what I get from this? I get major Zodiac Killer vibes. Yes, absolutely. Either that or like um, Son of Sam or something where it oh, just seems yes. completely random. And it's, especially being like held up by gunpoint as well. It's so random and it's so poorly planned and chaotic. I I mean, when you're giving your statement to the police after, you'd have to be like, well, this nerd walked up to us and pointed a gun at us because he he was not intimidating looking by any means and that was something that the victims would all point out a lot of them would say that he would they would call him like dorky or nerdy or whatever but they would also point out that he was really nervous about the whole thing and he would often like seem like he was more scared of everything than they were Yeah, because when he attacked the young nurse named Florence Hayden, he pointed the toy gun at her and told her that he would shoot her if she screamed, but she was a smart cookie and realized that the gun was absolutely not real. So she screamed anyway and ran away, and she was the one that when she reported the crime, she said that her attacker seemed more than, like, more scared than she was. (laughs) It just seems very strange to me that someone who kind of has these very bold methods, is still very shy when attacking his victims. You know, you'd think that that being in that position of power over someone would make him more, like, confident or arrogant, but it doesn't seem like that was the case. Absolutely. Like, not to, like, get fully, like, armchair psychologist here, but, like, to (laughs) me, it's so interesting because there's the Harvey that Harvey wants to be, and then there's the Harvey that Harvey is, and those are two very different people. 100%. That evening, Harvey struck again. This time, he approached the two women who were out for a walk. But as soon as he was close to them, he became nervous and he instead demanded their purses. And demanded might be too strong of a word because he basically mumbled and struggled to form a sentence and eventually got out the words, give me your pocketbooks. Not exactly the smoothest fella, like at all. He took their pocketbooks and he ran away. This attack was reported, and the descriptions that they gave matched the ones from Florence. Two days later, Harvey was arrested again. I get this. He was literally in the process of going after his next victim when they arrested him. He was found carrying the toy gun, rope, and a knife. And he confessed to everything immediately. And guys, he is only 19 years old at this point. His parents were, to be fair, devastated. They had been completely convinced that their son had been reformed. And this is where I start to wonder, because at what point do we blame the parents for not opening their eyes to everything that was happening right in front of them? Like, I understand that they want him to succeed and they want him to do well and they're helping him. But once again, he doesn't want to change. I can't imagine being a parent whose child is doing the most heinous shit, but I think there comes a point when you have to take a step back and realize that this person, your son, is a person who is hurting a lot of other people, right? And there's only going to be so much you can do for them. That's got to be a really difficult thing to come to terms with. Yeah, I, I can't imagine, you know, I think about the families of serial killers who genuinely didn't know. I think often of like Dennis Raider's family and how they they had no clue that he was a monster finding that out at the end of everything must I, I can't imagine but then you have these parents that are seeing this happen and surely they're seeing him get worse they've seen him since he was a little boy you know it's it's horrifying and and speaking of BTK yes giant shout out to oh yes oh my god can we fangirl? Are we allowed to fangirl on our own podcast? We I, can do whatever we want. Fuck I it. think so. Okay, so Carrie Rawson, the daughter of Dennis Rader, BTK, who is an amazing victim's advocate and just overall Badass. powerful human being. Yes. She followed us on Twitter. She knows we exist. That's crazy Car- to me. Carrie Rawson, we love you. Like, holy oh. shit. 
Like, <laughs> that genuinely made my day. Well, my whole week, honestly. She's such a cool person. If you guys are not following her on Twitter and stuff, please go follow her because she does amazing work and she's an advocate for people in the most horrendous position yeah and she's just an overall wonderful human being so go yeah. follow her on Twitter. we are huge fans of everything she does and it was honestly just awesome and yeah we have to share that with everybody because yay yay anyway back <laughs> back to back to the bad <laughs> shitty harvey glattman okay all right back to him his mother begged the court to go easy on him she was tearful she was sobbing in front of them and begging and it didn't work he was given a five to ten year sentence for the crimes. While he was incarcerated, he was evaluated by a number of psychiatrists. It was deemed that he was not definitely mentally defective or psychotic. He was released after two years and eight months for good behavior. So he didn't even get to the five out of the five to ten years. Not even close. And for what it's worth, it does seem like he behaved well in prison. Well, I mean, there were no women for him to assault in prison, mm -hmm. so, you know. Uh, this kind of thing always pisses me off. Yeah. Because you have someone who is a repeat offender, even after serving time, and as we've seen, several times, and then you release him for good behavior again. Of course he's going to behave. The conditions for his twisted, nasty fantasies have been removed. He's in an isolated, controlled environment. He's already shown that when he does get released, the first thing he does is re-offend. The best place for him is probably prison. Absolutely. He has, like, already he's shown that he has no positive place in society. All he does is hurt people. Fool me once, you know, shame on me. Fool me twice. Fool me three times. Fool me four times. Like, guys, How many hello? times do you have to be fooled? Exactly. There's no doubt that by this point, despite his young age, Harvey Glattman had learned how to manipulate almost everyone around him. Like, he's one of those horrible people that we talk about that was so manipulative that the only people who probably saw the real Harvey Glattman were his victims. Very true. Yeah. He gives me like major Pee Wee Gaskins vibes, but if Pee Wee Gaskins was a city boy. And also had, like, no riz whatsoever. Like, at least uh, Pee-wee had an arrogance to him. At least Pee-wee had catchphrases. Yeah, Harvey like, Glattman can't even make eye contact with you. While exactly. Pee-wee yeah. exactly. Pee had, like, some kind of pizzazz. Honestly, you know you're bad when you're being compared to Pee-wee Gaskins and you come out the loser. Literally. When you're the loser of serial killers, you've done something <laughs> fucking wrong in your life. Oh, my God. Something important to point out with Harvey is that a huge amount of the court records have actually been lost, but there are some documents from the time he spent on parole, and because of those, we have a fair bit to go off of. Now, we do know that he was released under the stipulation that he lived with his parents and that he maintained a steady job. And once again, surprise, surprise, he didn't really manage to do that either. He was employed on and off, but for the most part, he stayed out of trouble. As far as we know, he didn't assault anyone during this time, but it's possible that he did and that he just didn't get caught. I would be shocked if he was behaving for this long. Very much so, especially, like I said, we've already seen him develop a pattern, and it would be very strange for him given his fast escalation to just kind of play it cool for this Exactly. Song. He got along all right with his parents, but that all changed when his dad passed away in 1952. During this time, something shifted between him and his mother, and they began to argue more frequently. Can you blame her? I would feel <sighs> scared, I think, to be honest with you, being in a house with him, knowing what he's capable of. Especially when there is no other male presence around. Mm -hmm. Like, I wouldn't want to be anywhere near him. No. He began to despise his mother, and he became desperate to get as far away from her as possible. He eventually did get his own place, and by 1956, his time on parole was over. Harvey was excited to finally start living his life without anyone watching him and breathing down his neck. He was eager for yet another change of scenery, but this time, he set his sights on somewhere far away from home, sunny Los Angeles. He was now 30 years old and ready for a fresh new start. He also picked up his camera again and reignited his love for photography. 
This led to him renting a studio on Melrose Avenue where he began offering his services as a photographer to young local models under the name Johnny Glenn. Ugh, it's just, it's gotten sleaze written all over it. It's a terrible name. It reminds me of like a guy who slicks his hair back and he wears an unbuttoned shirt with all of his chest hair sticking out of it. Like trying to sell you like a gross used car or something. I think of Quagmire from Family Guy. Yes. Well, I think Quagmire's first name is Glenn, right? It is. So maybe that's why, yeah. That's probably Um, why. Harvey Glattman, or Johnny Glenn as he was now being called, was enjoying the sun and palm trees of L.A. As far as he was concerned, he had left the past behind him and it was finally time to get out and enjoy his life. Unfortunately, like they had so many times before, things would very quickly escalate. And that's where we'll be picking up things next week. And if things weren't already rough here already, they're going to get so much worse because at this point i will remind you harvey has victimized a ton of women but he still hasn't committed the crimes that were going to land him in the execution chamber this story is very much a nightmare already but it is going to get so much worse from here on out there is no doubt about that first half of harvey glattman how are you feeling it's just so gross. He's gross. I He's hate so him. gross. Honestly, that's the best way to describe him. He is gross. Ick. Bad. I always hate to shit on anyone because of their appearance, because that is something that is completely out of your control. Mm-hmm. However, I'll take the mean girl route. If you are this sh- shitty of a human being... To me, it's just your ugliness is representing what's on the inside, and I am not sorry about it. 100%. He was just awful. And honestly, I know I said it, but like, I, my thoughts, I've talked about this a lot. Again, listen to our Carla Faye Tucker episode for a whole breakdown on this, but like, the death penalty, do I believe in it? Not necessarily, but if it's gonna happen, it's gonna happen for people like this. It, yes, these are the people that prove time and time again, you have not been able to play by the rules of society. You are a fucking menace chaos demon. Get out. Yeah. And again, it's just going to get worse. Like we keep saying that, but like it's is bad. Yeah, so just brace yourself for next week. Yeah. <laughs> um, we did let you guys know last week that we have a few new items in the Grim Trinket shop over on Etsy. So if you want to check those out, take a peek at the links in the descriptions. It's also just, it's a really great way to support the podcast. And I do just want to quickly chime in. All of our designs so far have been done by Charlotte. She is so incredibly talented and I'm always <laughs> going to just like clap for you because you're awesome so you guys support the store because she's doing some good work for us no you we conceptualize things together you guys out there have also thrown a bunch of really cool ideas our way it's just a matter of getting the time to design them but i do take all of them into account you guys have been wonderful so far with all of the support and so speaking of other support Our Patreon is a fabulous way to support the podcast and get access to a ton of extra content. And we also want to give a huge shout out to our Grim VIPs and up. Thank you so much to Judy, Brian, Mudkip, Johnny, Hillary, Kevin, Bob, Lisa, and Pink Flamingo 20. The list seems to get longer every week. I was just going to say that. Oh Oh. my goodness. You guys are the bomb.com. You guys are the titty city. Like seriously. I honestly like it's even if you sign up for any tier it it means the absolute world to us because it's just all of that is extra help to grow and to do more with this podcast and this is our little little baby that has grown and we're so proud of it and it's just amazing that people actually it still blows my mind that people listen first and foremost but like it's certainly not um, like a, you are in no way obligated to throw your money at us, but you guys, we appreciate it so much that even you want to support us in this way. Yeah. So honestly, from the bottom of our hearts, thank you so, so much. You 
get a ton of uh, access to fun content and uh, Dina always throws up the early episode reveals each week. Um, you can join our Discord where we talk about stuff um, that we talk about on the podcast and get into all sorts of crazy discussions. And like Dina said, our lowest tier is as little as $3 a month. So uh, yes, I will stop blabbing about Patreon now. Honestly, also, if you want to support but you don't want to spend the money, like our videos, comment on our content, share it. It helps us a lot because internet algorithms are a bitch and uh we we appreciate the help heck yeah we do we also want to remind you guys that episode three of the grim curriculum extra credit will be out this wednesday Mm -hmm. so check it out uh we're going to be discussing all sorts of wacky things and if you have any topics you want us to go over on our casual show let us know and we'll uh we'll add them to the list yeah and they can be stuff that's like We don't usually cover things that are very current on the main Grim Curriculum show. So if there's like a current event that you want us to like check out or like an article about your town that you found that you want us to check out, like throw that shit our way. We love it. Yes, absolutely. And you can contact us through any of our platforms or you can email us at thegrimcurriculum at gmail.com. To keep up with all the latest Grim Curriculum news, you can follow us on all the social media platforms. We're on Twitter, we're on Instagram, we're on Facebook, we're on TikTok. And we also have our personal accounts, so we'll link those down below too if you want to see like our animals and what we're getting up to. (laughs) (laughs) Absolutely. Thank you all so much for listening. This has been The The Grim Grim Curriculum. Curriculum. Dina, have you heard of Colobopsis explodens? No. They are a species of explosive ants that kill themselves to protect their colony by splitting their skin open and coating their enemies in yellow goo. Oh my god, that's dedication. I love it. It's wild. (laughs) Nature, you scary. Bye, friends. (laughs)